children spoke for all of us, standing in the need of prayer. So we're going to consider our lessons this morning on a sermon titled, Unforgettable Moments. So now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable unto you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. How many of us can survey the contour of our lives and recall particular moments that shaped them? Events, milestones, decisions that serve as a fulcrum of sorts, dividing our lives between before and after. I was listening to a series this week on the radio chronicling how national and world events have impacted the outlooks of First 25-year-olds, then 45-year-olds, and finally 65-year-olds. Living through the 9-11 tragedy as young children and witnessing their parents' unemployment during the 2008 recession has tended to make the youngest group view the world with uncertainty. 45-year-olds, of course, lived through that period as well, but they maintain feelings of optimism through remembering events like the fall of the Berlin Wall. 65-year-olds, interestingly, recall the media as being balanced and reassuring through news anchors like Walter Cronkite. But they also remember the tumult in 1968 of the assassinations of both JFK and Martin Luther King Jr. Events, words, feelings that shape our lives. These are all large-scale socio-political examples, yet they are defining moments in our individual lives as well. Unforgettable occasions, significant decisions, occurrences that point to a future completely different from the one we had come to envision. I'm sure that's how the woman would look back and describe the encounter that she had with Jesus in this morning's gospel story, an account found only in Luke. We find Jesus approaching a town called Nain after having recently healed the slave of a centurion in Capernaum some 25 miles away. Jesus is far from alone. The disciples and a large crowd, it says, are with him. Jesus is becoming famous. People are following. And he arrives at Nain's city gates, and his entourage meets a second group, described in Greek using the same word. Yes, it's another large crowd come into view, but this one is leaving the city rather than entering it. The exiting group, it turns out, is a funeral procession. <clears throat> to be sure, death is always a struggle, always a tragic singular event, but this particular loss has unusually severe implications because the grieving individual is a widow and the deceased her only son. At issue is this woman of the ancient world has a very limited number of safety nets with which to shield herself from hunger and want. The first is to get married and the second is to have a son. And we glean from the text that this woman has accomplished both. Yet blow by blow, her world has been ripped apart. At some point, she clearly lost her husband, and now her only son is dead. In other words, the two people best equipped to provide a roof over her head, a tunic around her body, and food in her stomach are gone. I'm sure you noticed a virtual identical scenario launching our Old Testament reading written centuries earlier from the Elijah cycle in 1 Kings. Also a bereft single widow and another dead son. 
So clearly this challenging social norm is well established. And the widow from Nain in Jesus' time knows very well the plight that lies ahead. So along with the normal grief of losing a loved one, the widow from Nain is feeling like her life is over along with her sons. She has nowhere to turn. As far as the widow is concerned, this crowded procession is a double funeral, both for her dead son and for her. They're on a death march to the outskirts of the city where the son and the woman's hope will be buried. Her future is dashed. Little does this death crowd know that it will come face to face with another crowd an enthusiastic crowd, which includes Jesus. Yes, the procession of death meets a procession of new life. A close read reveals that the widow is so engulfed in her grief that she doesn't say a word to Jesus. She doesn't look at him. She doesn't ask him for anything. She doesn't engage him in any way. But that doesn't stop Jesus from noticing her. Even amidst all these crowds, the text says that Jesus sees her. Yes, Jesus sees a childless widow, one that is largely invisible to the rest of society. Anyone else would keep going oblivious. But Jesus has compassion. The word in Greek is so rich and descriptive that I have to share it with you. Esplagnizomai, which suggests a literal physical reaction. Jesus is moved in the gut, a pit in his stomach, where the seat of emotions were thought to reside, the bowels. As an expression of grace, unbidden, Unexpected, Jesus speaks. Don't cry, he begins. And then Jesus acts. The contrast with Elijah is intentional and obvious. In 1 Kings, Elijah needed to stretch over the child three times and cry out to God for a miracle. But Jesus has decisive, immediate power all on his own. Jesus only touches the beer and not the child, and he utters words directly to the boy. Young man, I say to you, rise. And with that, the boy begins to speak, and he is handed to his mother. Talk about an unforgettable moment which redefines the future. The death procession and the new life procession unite as everyone is amazed and seized with fear. They name Jesus a prophet, such as the world has never seen. Healing a centurion slave and now a boy without even touching them. Performing a miracle without even being asked. Luke ends the story stating that the word about Jesus spread throughout Judea. Maybe a literary mix-up. They're still in Galilee in the north. Or just maybe. The writer is highlighting how Jesus' reputation will precede him as he gathers even more crowds on his way to a hostile Jerusalem and his place of death. Pentecost. It's the church season to focus on growth, with lessons on Jesus' teachings and his activities and his, his ministry here on earth. So at the most basic of levels, today's miracle has value in the spirit of simply knowing our stories of faith, knowing our Bible, knowing about Jesus. But if we're to grow from the narrative, it seems to me we need to delve a little deeper and also consider what it might be saying to our day-to-day -day lives. On the one hand, there's an emphasis on how Jesus' compassion is his motivation for ministry, 
So I suppose a good lesson to glean might be that we're to be compassionate as well. And that's true enough, we are. But I don't think that's the primary message today. For even if we were to seek and go and do likewise, we don't wield that kind of power. So I think the key lesson <coughs> lies elsewhere and has to do with the power of Jesus in our lives. For today's miracle is an expression of the surprising presence and power of grace. Grace that's always there, whether we ask for it or not. Always available to receive and show us a new narrative of possibility and hope. While in the death procession, the widow from Maine looked at her future and she saw nothing but grief, a dead son, an already marginalized life made more desperate and a future erased. But this death cadence was interrupted by grace, hope, new life, through Jesus who saw her in the midst of her struggles, she learned a way forward. Through Jesus, there was possibility for the widow, and there is for us. Through Jesus, there is hope. Through Jesus, there is life, which will always and forever be stronger than death. Though our struggles and our death marches, they're real. They can be transformed into new life marches, and our future can be redefined when it's reshaped by our trust in the ever-present grace of God. As our psalmist proclaimed this morning, weeping spends the night, but joy comes in the morning. Perhaps you too read in the Herald about Aaron Willis, who graduated this week from Booker T. Washington High School. Not so unusual that someone would cross a stage and pick up a diploma at this time of year. But it's amazing if you have faced the challenges that Aaron Willis has. Life has never been easy for Aaron. His family was homeless at age six. But even more life-changing was being shot by a random bullet during his freshman year in high school that shattered a vertebrae and paralyzed him. Willis was catapulted into a death procession that was filled with indescribable pain and hardship. He said in the article I read that at times he's considered suicide. But a narrative of hope kept him marching on. Eventually he was connected to the University of Miami that allowed him to learn how to walk with an exoskeleton. So on graduation day, with bionic legs strapped under his gown, Aaron left not a beer, but a wheelchair backstage, surprised his classmates, and this young man rose up and walked to get his degree. The large crowd in the arts center jumped to their feet, chanting his name while the bass drum thumped to the rhythm. His father gasped. It is a miracle. And Aaron Willis stood up and walked toward his high school graduation, his FIU scholarship, and his future. <clears throat> the graduate's assessment, I'm really happy and really blessed to be here. Grace, unbidden, undeserved, Amazing, even amidst hardships that are devastating and real, new life is possible because Jesus sees us. Joy can come in the morning as the Lord transforms our processions of death into processions of new and everlasting life. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus.